This is Tech Pulse, the show that keeps you in step with the technological world and one step ahead of everybody else. I'm your host, Harvey Reginald Smith II. Let's start the show. up what's up this is tech pulse for may 3rd 2013 so what's going on out there in the tech world you know this is the only show where you're gonna uh, get all your tech news get all your tech information you're gonna be able to assimilate it find out what's going on and be caught up with everyone in the tech world so let's head right down to our first story let's not waste any time you're going to start right off in the gaming world because uh, uh, there's, there's some interesting developments going on in that gaming world. And in the gaming world, uh, uh, we're talking about none other than uh, Nintendo. We're talking about Nintendo, but we're also talking about EA. Now, um, uh, according to a story that um, uh, came out uh, uh, yesterday uh, with The Verge, EA Sports has said, has announced, and the reason this, this is big, it might not sound too big if you're not a gaming fan, but EA has announced that they are not going to bring Madden NFL franchise this year to the Wii U. They have said that they're going to skip the Wii U this year. Now, why is this important? Uh, for two reasons. Now, now, first, let me give you a bit of the story. Let me tell you a bit of the story before we uh, uh, get into the reasons. And as you know, uh, one of video gaming's most popular franchises, that's the Madden series, most popular franchises is going to skip, like I just said, the Nintendo Wii this year for the first time. This is the first time EA said they're going to skip the Nintendo, um, uh, Nintendo system for over two decades, 20 years, despite um, a Wii U release with um, Madden NFL uh, 13 last year when the Wii U came out in November. They got uh, Madden NFL 13 um, as well with that release. Despite that, um, EA Sports' upcoming Madden NFL 25 will not be making an appearance on Nintendo's latest console. And that came right from not only EA, but also a spokesperson from Nintendo. Uh, and then uh, with, a, uh, with a, uh, a quote coming from, um, uh, 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 coming from uh, uh, Nintendo... Uh, the quote says that we will not be releasing a Wii U version of Madden NFL 2013. However, we have a strong partnership with Nintendo. I mean, this is from EA, sorry. We have a strong partnership with Nintendo and will continue to evaluate opportunities for delivering additional Madden NFL products for Nintendo fans in the future. Now, while obviously it looks like EA is open, uh, leaving the door open for future Madden, they didn't shut it and say we're never doing it. They're saying we still have a strong relationship with uh, Nintendo, but um, we're just not going to be releasing Madden for the, 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 for, uh, the Wii U this year. That decision is what raises uh, 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 the questions and the two concerns that we're going to talk about right now. Here are the two concerns as I see them uh, with this situation. EA, first of all, EA is not the game company that they once was. EA was one of the Biggest, and when I say biggest companies, EA could be compared to um, um, Apple or could be compared to Microsoft in terms of software development back in the, the, the early 90s and, and, and in the 2000s. They could be compared to Apple as far as cash. That company had cash to spend. I mean, their facility was known as one of the mo most luxurious facilities for software developers anywhere. I mean, they had basketball courts on their property. Courts! Not a, a rinky-dink uh, a, a half a parking lot or something like that that they just relegated with a hoop. No, they had courts there. They also had lounges specifically designed for employees to take naps. You know, they had workout facilities specifically designed around their employees because back in the days, and, and, and many software engineers know this, and they can attest to this, that when deadline's about to hit, these people are sleeping under their tables, in their cubicles. They don't go home. Literally, they don't go home. I mean, if you ever played any game made by any decent software developer, look at the credits. 
And in the credits, you'll see a lot of them saying, we thank our families for the tireless nights we spent away. That's what they put in the credits. You know what I'm saying? When they're talking about the people they thank, you know? So software engineers are a dedicated, gamers are a dedicated group of people. And EA used to be that company that had the large facility. And over the years, they came out and this brings up a couple of points we've been talking about on Tech Pulse. They bring out a couple of games <coughs> that doesn't really sell, excuse me, <coughs> like the game they came out with um, a while ago called Mirror's Edge. If anybody knows about Mirror's Edge, that game was phenomenal, but for whatever reason, it just didn't sell. It was a first-person game, not a first-person shooter. A first-person game, you played someone, a futuristic person, whose job it was to uncover uh, a sinister uh, plot with, with the government and some uh, like like um, um, organized crime. And you were the only one that could do it. Now, you were a, a message carrier of the future. And in the future, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, message carriers in the future, what they did was they ran on rooftops. You had the ability to run along the wall and do all type of stuff. And your goal uh, or your, your abilities weren't about shooting people. If uh, armed men were after you, you would have to use your quick reflexes and knock them out and stuff like that. Now, normally a game like this is played in third person so you can see your character. EA came up with the concept of using this as a first person game and you would do karate, you know, judo, martial arts and all of that to unarmed people. And if you picked up their gun, it would only have like maybe one or two uh, bullets left in it. So you couldn't go around and constantly, there was no ammo on the ground, nothing like that. You had to be the person to decide how to uh, 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 advance in the game without killing. And so uh, uh, when you ran along rooftops and the graphics were just, were just crisp, this was just a game that all critics said was a top-notch game, but nobody bought it. EA started coming out with a couple of games like that, like, like um, brand new indie games like that. They started coming out with games like that, and what happened? They didn't sell. And because they didn't sell, EA started losing money. Now, EA is at the point where they can no longer fund games that may not turn a profit. There was a time when EA would release a game you know, on a system even if the system was uh, 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 known to be done. I mean, where, uh, they would still release system, uh, uh, games for uh, uh, like um, um, Game Boy Advance, even though uh, the Game Boy Advance was done. You know, they would still release a title for it because they saw that, well, you know, people still have Game Boy Advance and they could afford to, you see? They would release games for Xbox after Xbox was done, you know, but <clears throat> they could afford to. But recently, they can't afford to release games on uh, uh, systems that's not selling. Now, that's the first point, that EA is not the company that they were once was because EA invested in a lot of games that weren't mainstream, you see, and that goes to show what we're talking about in the gaming industry that if you're not releasing the same kinds of titles that are proven <clears throat> like first person shooters like sports fighting games stuff like that if you're not releasing those you're not really going to make any money and that has caused the gaming market to become stagnant it has caused the gaming market to become stagnant because there's no creativity companies don't want to risk coming out with games that may not sell so now nintendo Here's where it hits Nintendo. They came up with the Wii U, right? Right away, they thought they were gonna have the same success with the Wii U that they had with the, um, with the Wii. Now remember, they said that the Wii was a uh, console that was coming out for <clears throat> um, everybody. They were trying to hit what they call the casual gamer market. Now, here's why something like that, to me, uh, makes no sense. Because you're coming out for a group of gamers that don't play games. Hence the reason why they call themselves casual gamers. In other words, they play games now and again. You're gonna dedicate a system to them while you're leaving the hardcore gamer out. You see, yeah, they sold a lot of units, but guess what? Those casual gamers are living up to their names because now you come up with the Wii U and they're saying, we have a system already. We're not gonna buy the Wii U because we got the Wii. That's what casual gamers mean. They're not going to buy all the systems because they don't play games like the hardcore gamer. So Nintendo came up with the Wii U. It didn't have the success by any stretch of the imagination. So far to date, Nintendo has only sold 400,000 units 
to date, and they've been out for over six months. Now that might sound like a lot, four hundred thousand. No, not in the console world. Nintendo is used to selling. By now, they would have sold a minimum of three million units uh, 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 in the U.S. alone. A minimum of three million units. They only sold four hundred thousand. That's not a lot to keep a company up and running. And Nintendo bet it on the fact that those same casual gamers that they garnered and they, they didn't understand the concept and this was something that a lot of hardcore gamers was talking about when Nintendo decided to ditch us for the casual gamer. They were saying that these gamers are not going to sustain your market. They're going to give you a console. Yes, like right now, the Wii was a success. Yes, we have to admit it. But now you come up with a Wii U and then the only difference you really uh, uh, say is the, the, the screen controller and guess what? Madden is one of the franchises that would definitely benefit from having that second screen controller because you can draw your own plays on that screen and no one would know. You know, that was one of the big uh, features coming up with Madden, that you could design your own play. So the reason that they would uh, pull Madden, EA would pull Madden for the Wii U when it had this cap when it has this capability, to me shows that they don't have confidence that the Wii U is a viable console anymore. And then Nintendo pulling out of E3 saying they're not going to have a keynote in E3, that right away tells Nintendo fans, tell gamers that even Nintendo is not necessarily feeling that this console is going to, to, to uh, 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 be a console of the future. And, uh, um, uh, and, and then um, Nintendo released an update on the Wii U message board. They released an update for all of us uh, gamers, and they said, you know, yeah, we're not going to have um, Madden NFL for um, the Wii U this year, but guess what? Remember, you can play all your Wii games on the Wii U. And what does that mean? I can play... So, you want us to buy a system that we can play the games we already are playing on the Wii? Why am I going to buy a Wii U to play the same games I'm playing now. You see, that just looks like Nintendo is just trying to garner as much support uh, 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 with this announcement coming out. And I'm saying that Nintendo is really in a bad position right now. Will the Wii U fail? The way it's looking, I don't see the Wii U being able to live out the year. If Nintendo doesn't do something at E3, I don't see the Wii U being able to live out this year. And that's, that's why this story was such a... Um, was such a, 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 a blast, if you will. Because if Nintendo cannot get the Wii U up and running like they, they thought, <clears throat> they would be able to do. If they can't do that, there's no way that, uh, in my opinion, they're going to be able to survive this 2013 gaming season. And it's a shame because Nintendo has, the, that, that console has potential. Just like the Wii had potential, but Nintendo never exploited the true potential of the Wii. They kept coming out with Big Mama Cook-Off, Ramsey's Kitchen Nightmare type games that nobody cared about. You know, I mean, the casual gamer might have bought it, but are the casual gamers buying games now? No, because they're casual. They don't play games like the hardcore gamer. And that's what Nintendo forgot. So companies like Sony, companies like Microsoft, take note. Do not... Get the hardcore gamer on your bad side. Simply because if the hardcore gamer leaves your market, you're not going to sell anything. And that <clears throat> is what happened to Nintendo. It doesn't matter how big you are. The hardcore gamer wants content. And it's proven that hardware doesn't sell uh, 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 games. Software sells games. Hardware doesn't keep a system alive. Software keeps a system alive. So if you're going... To, to uh, 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 keep the gaming market, uh, Microsoft and uh, uh, Sony, if you're going to keep that gaming market, you better have some software to back up your system and don't leave the hardcore gamer out because we are the ones that have you know, grown the market. You know, it's just like when Hollywood comes out with movies. They come out with comic book movies like Spider-Man, like Avengers, like The Incredible Hulk. And then when you, when you interview the... Uh, the um, when you interview the, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> the producer, he's saying, well, we really are trying to make Iron Man, you know, appeal to, you know, the, a, wide, uh, a wide audience. You know, we're really trying to, to identify with the regular man. And we as gamers, uh, as comic book fans and gamers are saying, why? 
The reason why you're coming out with Iron Man is because we exist. We made a market for this game or for this, this movie. So when you go in and you start changing things up and trying to appeal to people that don't care, how, what sense does that make? Let me tell you how people would make money, how the movie companies make money, the franchises. When I am a comic book fan, you know, uh, uh, let's not use me. Let's use uh, Devin, for example. Let's say uh, Devin's daughter, Ariana. You know, she's a comic book fan. <laughs> Devin is throwing his hands up and saying, why? Why me? Let's say he, she's a comic book fan. Or his son. Uh, his, his son, you know what I'm saying, uh, is a better example. He's a comic book fan. He goes, Dad, um, the Avengers are out. The Avengers are out. We, we got to go see them. You know? And, you know, Devin doesn't really care about the Avengers. That's not his thing. But because he wants to do something with his son, he said, okay, let's go. So he, his son, and Anne-Marie, his wife, they all go to the movies to see Avengers. That's three people seeing Avengers, right? The next, next, next night, or the next weekend or whatever, he goes and he asks um, um, his son, hey, you, you want to see a movie tonight? Oh, man, I want to see Avengers again, Dad. He's like, oh, man, again? I want to see that. Come on, please. All right. That's twice. What? They're seeing the movie. Twice. And then after he's finished that now, the son goes on and uh, he tells his friends, oh man, you haven't seen I, um, um, Avengers yet? We got to go see that. And they bust out and they see that now. That's three times. Why? Because the comic book fan who loved the movie, he is the one spreading the word and getting people who don't care to come and see the movie. But if you make it cater to the people who don't care, when the comic book fans go and see that movie, what are they going to do? The comic book fans are going to say, you know what? This movie is no good, like, like it was with the original Hulk, like it was with Daredevil, like it was with Catwoman, like it was with the uh, 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 Batman series as it went down. The comic book fan didn't like those movies, so what happened? The regular people who don't care who Hollywood made the movie for didn't go see it either. Why? Because nobody cared. So you cannot alienate your core audience. That's the point, and that's what Nintendo has done. They have alienated their core audience, and now the Wii U is a failure as far as gaming consoles go. 400 units in six months? No. So we can only hope that Microsoft and the rest of the gang, they are looking. They are looking at this and saying, you know what? We are not going to make that same mistake. We're going to make sure <clears throat> that we do something different. You see? So uh, uh, that's just something that I thought all the gaming fans out there got to know. If you're a Wii U owner, you know, EA is not making a game for the, uh, 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 Madden for the Wii U this year. And that shows something about EA as well as a company. EA was a well-respected software company. It would be a shame if this company can't find a way to make themselves profitable again. The Madden franchise is obviously profitable, but with one less market to sell to, that simply means they're not going to have those cash reserves that they used to have. So EA is going to have to, they're going to have to do something to make sure they get their quality, um, 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 their quality of games up so they can compete uh, uh, in this new gaming era uh, that we have. All right, in other news. Just, with just, just a little tidbit. Um, there's a story. There's a story going around that uh, <laughs> Will Smith died um, about seven minutes ago. Will in, Smith? Yeah. Wow, let's see if we can find, um, find that story. I'm trying to see if it's a hoax or what the deal is with it. Um, my gut feeling <clears> is <throat> it's a hoax, but unconfirmed right, right. now. So I'm well, they're saying breaking news uh, uh, in New Zealand. They say Will Smith falls to his death. In his actor Will Smith died while filming a movie in New Zealand early this morning, May 3rd, 2013, according to reports. They say preliminary reports from New Zealand. Police officials indicate that the actor fell more than 60 feet to his death on the Karoo Cliffs while on set. Specific details are not yet available. The accident occurred approximately 4.30 a.m. Um, uh, New Zealand time. They're saying that's what the report uh, says where, right now. Where are you getting the... <clears throat> From the Global Associated News. Yeah, some... I have one that says it's a hoax. That's what they... they yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, we don't know how, uh, how credible this is. Um, but, uh, you know, also, um, a, 
a uh, report from uh, that was a global uh, Associated okay, Press. So that's not possible because here there is a uh, seven hours ago. He is uh, he's at the Earth Conference. Yeah. In Tokyo. And uh, according to the Washington Post, they say that uh, Will Smith is not dead, just a victim of a nasty rumor that you may have seen on the internet this weekend. Said the Village Voice reports that the latest celebrity death hoax started on fakeawish.com, which allows users to create a news story using an actor's first and last name. After typing in Will and then Smith, a few options popped up, including the story, Will Smith falls to his death in New Zealand. Twitter users helped spread the rumor using a link to an official looking story from, a, from Global Associated News over the weekend. It seemed people have fallen uh, for this exact rumor before, so don't be fooled, internet users. This is coming from the Washington Post, so uh, just a hoax that they had going over the internet. Okay. Um, nothing, you know, and apparently this is stuff that they do all the time. They have, so they have hoax on the internet for celebrity deaths, so. You know, uh, we know that this is not uh, a real, real story. So, going back into the tech news, you know, just a little uh, sidebar there, making sure that everything is okay. So, if, if you read that story, you know that uh, it's not true. <clears throat> now, back into the uh, tech news. We're talking about uh, Facebook now, and Facebook have uh, they have released their uh, quote quarterly earnings, their Q1 earnings for this year, uh, uh, and according to a report uh, uh, you know, yesterday by uh, TechCrunch, uh, Facebook has posted its earnings for the first quarter ending March 31st, 2013, and Facebook hit $1.46 in revenue so far for the quarter. That's up 38% from Q1 in 2012. Uh, uh, beating uh, what Wall Street um, estimates thought was going to be only 1.44 billion. Facebook reported earnings of 1.06 billion for the same quarter a year ago. The earnings per share missed the estimates, staying flat at 12 cents. Uh, uh, 12 cents, and the net income was up 7% for Facebook at two. $119 million versus 205 a year ago. So Facebook is moving up in, um, sorry, moving up in terms of their percentages and things like that. And the things they're coming out with seem to be working. They came out with Facebook Home, a risky move, but they've been uh, signing people up at an average of 100,000 people a day on, on Facebook Home. Um, uh, they're, they're releasing their ad campaign this summer, and they're saying, Facebook is saying that they're hoping to get $4 um, um, million dollars a day worth of ad revenue that they're selling, each for a million dollars each, ad slots for a million dollars each. Now, uh, uh, keep in mind that Facebook has over a billion active users. That's crazy. Not a billion signed up, and you don't know what they're doing. Facebook claims over a billion active users is what they have currently right now. And so selling ad slots for a million dollars a pop is really when you work out how many viewers you're gonna be in front of, that really works out to be really not that much money. But uh, obviously you have to have the million dollars up front. And Facebook is saying that they're estimating that they're gonna be able to make four million a day from this ad campaign that they're releasing in, um, in um um in uh in the summer now Devin uh my, my question about Facebook is this Facebook has been on the upswing for quite a while now now and you you've seen businesses come and go you know saying uh, working in the investment world do you think Facebook can sustain this upswing I mean don't do, do they, they have to plateau sooner or later I'm not saying the company is going anywhere but this tremendous growth that they seem to continually be on in in a, in a revenue standpoint is there going to be a time you see in the in the near future where Facebook will plateau, or do you think Facebook is going to continue this this just dominance as far as generating money and and continual uh, uh, increase in profits go? Do you do you think that Facebook is going to be able to sustain that? Yeah, I think so because if if not in the near future, 
um, those Facebookers are having kids. <laughs> and so they have, you know, a ready-made group of, <laughs> of, of new generation <laughs> Facebookers. Facebookers. And um, I'm, I'm talking about not even including the teenagers right. now. That are currently... Yeah, my kid, my, right. my daughter's age, that are already primed and waiting to become to new members Facebook, of yeah. Facebook. You know is, is, does your son, uh, is he a, a Facebooker? Yeah, he, he's, he's more of an a, a instant communicator, okay. you know, instant right, right. messaging Right, it's user. his thing. Right. Yeah, he's not as much a uh, you know, Facebooker as, right. as he used to be. You, but you know what I mean? he's on there. He's on there. So you know, he's you probably he's probably doing Instagram more now. More than yeah. Than he does Facebook, but right. he's on. He's but the point you know, is he's on. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So you don't see that Facebook is going in the near future. In, no like way. I mean, their their earnings are gonna plateau sooner or later. I mean, every company. I don't see how that's gonna happen. You don't I see really how they're gonna plateau because mm. we we're having fewer people dying. Right. Now. Right. They're living longer, so there's gonna be an overlap of my age people right you know the the and my mother who is on facebook oh your mom is my mom on. is on facebook i i mean just imagine so that tells you right there all age groups so i'm talking about <clears throat> next 20 years yeah maybe right then facebook may start plateauing may, earnings wise you're saying i'm not even sure about <laughs> that i'm just kind of <laughs> saying okay let's give them a Something. conservative yeah estimation <clears throat> but not in terms of what the numbers look like yeah because they, they just keep going up no matter how you they're gonna how keep you spend going it. up because people i mean people when you have are, over a, when you have over a billion active yeah. users that right there says it all <clears throat> that's why their campaign this summer we were talking about it on a, a few uh, earlier tech balls that's going to be successful i'm just shooting for one percent of that of that and i'll be happy <laughs> So if Facebook wants to just drop us 1%, 1%, that's all. You know what I'm saying? We will be happy with those earnings. And uh, according to the report, mobile advertising revenue as a percentage of the total ad revenue for Facebook has hit 30% of Facebook's um, um, ad revenue for the first quarter compared to only 23%. So f Facebook is really hitting that mobile market even more. And right now we see Facebook launched um, Facebook Home. Uh, a, a platform or a launcher that they are specifically using for mobile devices. And um, that growth is going to be crucial for Facebook, which is because uh, they have been seeing pressure from Wall Street to show that they can perform on mobile devices where users are increasingly headed. As we know, everyone has some form of mobile device, be it a phone, be it a, a, a tablet, or, or something like that, or, or uh, Ultrabook. Uh, 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 people are going mobile, and we see that Facebook is wasting no time, wasting no time in making sure that they are on the cutting edge of the, uh, um, on the cutting edge of, of, of um, uh, revenue earning when it comes to uh, mobile devices. Now, speaking of Facebook, because I mean, this just goes to show that Facebook is continuing to think about um, uh, their customers and, and what their customers could want. Now, a couple of years ago, Facebook has been using um, uh, two-step authentication you know, for a little bit now. And um, <clears throat> they decided that that wasn't enough. <clears throat> they decided that was not enough. If you're going to truly be safe, Facebook has come up with something they call, they have launched uh, just yesterday, they, re they reported that, um, The Verge reported, Facebook has launched trusted contacts. Help from your friends <clears throat> if your account gets hacked. Now, let me, uh, l l let's talk a little bit about this, how it works. Um, <clears throat> Now, um, almost two years ago, you know, as I said, that Facebook launched their two-factor um, authenticated authentication, but um, they released Some, this. You know, so, I'm sorry. Somebody <clears throat> wants to know, you know, what's what's happening for your show today. What what else is um, coming up? Whoa! Well, well, some some of the stories coming yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Well, some of the stories. I know you talked about gaming. You know. We had uh, talked about gaming. 
We have a story on Google, uh, a story on uh, Windows 8, how it's doing in the desktop market. We also have a story coming up on, on Evernote. They're partnering with a company called Kakao Talk. It's a, uh, a, a company over there in, in uh, South Korea um, to, to beef up their uh, 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 messaging service. Also, we have a story on BlackBerry. Uh, uh, there are 10. Uh, their pictures have been leaked about uh, a phone that looks similar to BlackBerry phones of the past coming out. Um, uh, also, BlackBerry uh, uh, Q10 has gotten uh, government approval uh, for security and on its heels, so has Samsung Galaxy S4. We're also going to show you a video of the RoboFly, the world's smallest flying insect robot that was created. Also, uh, uh, a new app for the iPhone called Tractor DJ. So those of you that want to be DJs and you have the iPhone, iPhone has released a new app uh, for uh, that purpose. And uh, just a couple other stories we're going to have. So stay tuned to Tech Pulse for those stories. So now we're talking about Facebook and um, the fact that uh, they have launched what they call trusted contacts. <clears throat> trusted contacts. Now, how this thing works, according to Facebook, they're launching uh, trusted contacts. They launched it globally yesterday. Uh, this is a way to recover um, access to your account through friends you trust. Now, they're making that a, uh, that's why they call it trusted contact. The feature works by selecting between Two, um, uh, two to, uh, uh, no, it's three to five friends. I think Facebook is saying you, you select between three and five friends. You add, add them to your trusted contact list. If your account gets compromised for whatever reason, or you forget your password or anything like that, <clears throat> these friends can help by supplying security code. So you have to obviously trust these people not to, uh, go into your account yourself, but you put them on the trusted contacts list and they will be able to help you. It's an alternative to answering security questions or attempting to fill out <clears throat> web forms to recover um, accounts, but you will have to pick, obviously, your contacts wisely because you don't want to give it to some, you know, some, some punk who's just going to go into your Facebook page and do all kinds of uh, things. Facebook will send the codes directly to a friend <clears throat> and uh, to then distribute to an account owner. So uh, it's open to abuse if you pick a friend, obviously, who enjoys you know, the occasional uh, prank or, or always want to be wisecracking. But either way, it's a digital form of leaving a spare key, I guess, if you want to put it that way with a neighbor, how you would do something like that. That's the way it is. So with these friends who you pick, when you set up your account, <clears throat> Facebook will send them all the information that they need. They will have it now. So if something happens, rather than, you know, if the two-step authentication doesn't work, rather than having to remember, which you still can, you know, you can say forget password, you can still do that, but they can help log you in as well. You call them up, uh, they put in your, uh, your ID and stuff for you, and boom, you're up and running back in Facebook. So this is something that Facebook is launching um, called Trusted uh, Contacts. Facebook is launching that. So... <clears throat> If that's something that you're interested in, you know, you can go ahead and I will we'll show you and tell you exactly how to download that app. But right now, my question is, uh, 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 Facebook, uh, like we just said, um, Devin, you, 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 we just said that we don't see Facebook really going anywhere as far as revenue really dropping anytime soon. And, you know, I, I, can, I can see that even though it might look like, well, they got a plateau sooner or later, but they keep coming up with different things. It seems like Mark Zuckerberg's team keeps coming up with different things. It's like they're, they're, they're constantly trying new products, new different things. Some of them are paid, some of them are not. And you think this type of innovation is what will keep a company like Facebook on top versus uh, other companies? Or, or do you think they have just some mystique like Apple that just, you know, people just flocked whatever they uh whatever they do yeah i think there's an element of mystique you know when it comes to certain um businesses like facebook and and uh, black not blackberry 
But Sounds uh, oh no, not BlackBerry. <laughs> um, no, no, I was talking about um, the the Mac, the Apple, Apple, the iPhone. Apple, right, right. You know, <laughs> there's this mystique not around it. Yeah? That they, no, there's no mystique right now about BlackBerry. I think maybe there there's some berry mystique coming, but um, <laughs> right now there's no mystique. Yeah. And and uh, Steve Jobs took a lot of the mystique with him. But, right, you right. know, in terms of Apple. But Facebook is one of those companies that, you know, I used to do a thing in New York. I talk about a thing in New York when I was there. That if you stand on the street corner right. <clears throat> and point up in the sky, <clears throat> not you alone, because right. people just pass by and stare at you <laughs> like you're crazy. Right. But if you have one or two of your friends just stop by the corner right. and point up in the sky, I guarantee you within minutes... Because you have authentication with someone else, right. you know, supporting you looking up and you point and you go there, right there, right, right there. And people, before <laughs> long, you'll have a, a crowd right. of people pointing, pointing up, up in the right, sky right, going, right. yeah, I see it right, right there. And when there's what absolutely <laughs> nothing up there. So there's this thing about tagging along and being in the now right. and being <laughs> onto what everybody else right, is onto. Right that Facebook generates that on a minute-by-minute minute basis. Right, Because, right, right. <clears throat> you know, I got in touch with my friend. Right. And we, are you serious? Yeah, maybe yeah. I can reach my friend, too. <laughs> you know, and, and, and that it, whole adrenaline thing happens. And, and it just it, goes viral. Yeah, it just that. goes viral. So, yeah, yeah there, there's <clears throat> that mystique, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. So, you know, I mean, I, I just see Facebook being uh, 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 growing for a while now. So that Facebook um, trusted contacts, I mean... That seems like um, uh, we got to see how, it, how it's going to work. So just so you, just a recap of it. If you can't log into your account, say you signed up for Facebook trust account, you can't log in, just call three of your friends or, or five or whoever you, 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 you uh, uh, um, um, uh, selected for your trusted contact. Let them know you need help regaining access to your news feeds and birthday reminders and all that stuff. Each one will get a security code with instructions on how to help you. And once, and, 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 and not once, but only once, uh, you have all three codes, can you recover your account? So it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's another level. Um, it might be a bit tedious to uh, do something like that. I mean, Devin, is this something you see as useful? I mean, you get locked out of your account and um, you have to call, you because you have to have between three and five friends that you trust. You give them, uh, uh, put them on your trusted contact list, you get locked out, Facebook, and you call them up. They're going to go to uh, on Facebook. Facebook will send them three uh, separate codes. And when they Facebook send them three separate codes, they will now call you back and say, okay, Devin, the code is this, code is this, code is this. And then you put that in and you're back up and running in your account. Um, is that kind of tedious or is that just Facebook just giving you another way to be safe? I, yeah, I think it's just another way that I won't use is just, is just is you know it's probably a good idea or or potentially right. a good idea right. but I won't use it because I had someone that professed their love for me right that ended up hating me <laughs> so you, you know what I'm saying yeah yeah so re the trusted friends may not really be it's the trusted a temporary friends. thing right, it's a right. temporary feeling you know it's uh euphoric it's great <laughs> while it's last right, right. lasting and you know and before you know it i hate you right and then now they have access they to have access to everything and uh you're a dead meat <laughs> if you don't remember to unaccess them if there's such a word right you know deactivate them deactivate them, them trouble you know. So, yeah. so uh, yeah, I think this is, to me, I think I don't know how successful this um, trusted contacts that Facebook has launched is going to be just because, you know, people like ease, you know, the people and, and you e even though with the best of intentions, you have three friends who knows where they are, you know, you want to log on late at night, you know, they're sleeping or, you know, whatever. It, it, it's going to be a tough thing to be able to call all three of I, them. I like the option. I, yeah. I'm a person that likes to know that there's an option. Right. So right. if I, if somebody hits me over the head and I just lose my brain, I'll right. use the option. Right. But exactly. otherwise I won't. Exactly. You know, and somebody, I like just that there is an option. That there's an option. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I'm, I'm with that to where 
Um, uh, you can, it, it's an option for me to choose. You don't force me to use it, no, no. but it's an option for me to choose. Is it something that I would do? You know, probably not, you know, because it just seems like a lot of work, but you, you never know. There are some people that will use this service, I'm sure, like any service, you're never going to get zero users. There's always going to be people, and, and with Facebook having an install base of over a billion active users, and I don't even know how many uh, just sign up people uh, uh, Facebook claims to have in terms of people who sign up, but they don't really use their account that much. They're saying over a billion active you see what I'm saying? And the thing about it is, I mean, uh, Facebook clearly is going to outgrow the planet. I mean, they're going to have to, to they're going to have to make strategies on advertising uh, to the moon or something sooner or later. If they're ready over a billion, I mean, come on, you know. So this is something I, I can see people. Some people are going to use it. Uh, uh, so we're going to keep keep on touch with this story and see exactly how this thing how it plays out, you know. Because hey, the more chances you have to be secure on the internet, you know, the better. So um, that's just something we have to uh, 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 deal with. Now in other news, Evernote, for those of you that use um, Evernote, uh, they are partnering with a company called, and I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing this right, it's called K-A-K-A-O. Uh, -A -A uh, how would you pronounce that, uh, Devin? K-A-K-A-O. Cacao, yeah, something cacao. like that. Yeah, yeah, cacao. talk, uh, talk Sounds message. Brazilian, <laughs> working. Yeah, yeah, something like that. No, I, actually, it's South Korean. Um, That's uh, their fault. Yeah, yeah. you know, that it's a talk messaging service. They announced uh, uh, this week uh, that the online uh, uh, note storage and organization service, which is Evernote online storing, has partnered with the South Korean messaging service. Now, uh, a new version of Cacao Talk will uh, not allow users to save their conversations to Evernote, but will provide them the ability to share them with friends. So whereas you may not be able to you know, obviously save, you know, like, like now you can, um, um, Evernote's products obviously have traditionally been kind of introverted. You know, you're keeping your own, you're like your memories and your information basically for your own, own use uh, uh, to, to remind yourself of certain things. But um, uh, I think what Evernote is realizing is that there's a big demand for uh, collaboration uh, capabilities amongst people and stuff like that, hence sites like Facebook and things like that. And they're always uh, looking, according to their uh, uh, spokesperson, they're always looking for the most innovative ways to improve um, collaborative efforts. And with Cacao Talk, people will be able to share their memories more easily um, as well as keep the conversations that are important to them. Um, so there's a lot uh, 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 that's going on right now. Now currently there's no specific timeline for the rollout of the new Kakao Talk messaging service app that's going to be linked with Evernote integration. So uh, both companies are currently working uh, on the app development which will uh, initially go live according to a report in Korea only. So. For those of you that are Evernote fans and people who, who uh, uh, love to uh, uh, Evernote services uh, that deals with, you know, using, uh, you need to remember something or you need to, uh, uh, you know, you need to um, 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 uh, remember something later. You know, Evernote is, is something that a lot of people use. It's a very popular um, app. And now that they're uh, going to partner with Kakao Talk, a messaging uh, service dealing with voice, um, uh, this just allows you to share, you know, voice messages with people. You won't be able to save it to Evernote like you can your written text and things like that, but you will be able to share conversations with uh, other people you care about. So this is something good to watch for if you're an Evernote fan, you're someone that uh, 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 likes Evernote um, um, and uses Evernote, then this is something that really um, you should keep an eye on because uh, this is something. Uh, this is something that's that, uh, that's coming. You know, this is something that's coming for Evernote, and they really believe that this is going to improve um, Evernote's uh, ability. This is going to improve what Evernote really is all about. So we're gonna have to uh, wait and see. Now, speaking of situations where you might want to, you know, like with Evernote, you uh, read your messages later and stuff like that. Speaking of that, for those of you uh, that uh, use Instapaper. Um, uh, they have been bought by Betaworks. Now, 
first, let me uh, explain in case uh, people don't know uh, what Instapaper is, because um, obviously if you don't know what it is, then it's not really a news story to you. But um, Instapaper, uh, that uh, a service that many people use, is a web service that saves articles for later reading on the web. Um, um, uh, uh, so uh, you can use it on iOS devices, Android, even Amazon Kindle. After registering you know, for a free account, the service saves articles that the user selects with its read later you know, um, um, option. You know, so if you, like for example, it's like bookmarking, but you save it all in um, Instapaper. So if there's an article online that you want to read and you have an Instapaper account, uh, uh, you can read it through Instapaper. You just uh, 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 bookmark it there and you can access it anywhere. So like a lot of times you might say, well, um, um, what's the purpose of this? Because I can just bookmark a page anytime. Sure, you can on a specific laptop or on a specific computer with that browser. You can uh, bookmark anything. But what if you're away? What if uh, right now, you know, I'm sitting in front of my computer and I, I see a good story and I'm like, oh man, yeah, let me, let me bookmark that, read it later. Okay, but once I leave this computer, I can't access that because it was bookmarked on the web browser on this computer. So if I'm working on another computer I'm, I'm out remotely, I can't, I can't access that. Instapaper allows you, you know, obviously via their website in, or via their app that they have on, on mobile devices, Instapaper will allow you to go on the web and any story, anything that you see, you bookmark it on Instapaper and then wherever you go, as long as you have web access, you pop up the app and you can read it later on Instapaper. So uh, uh, many people use Instapaper uh, uh, now for that uh, uh, very reason. Now Betaworks, uh, the company that has bought uh, Instapaper, many people don't know about Betaworks because um, they're not really uh, a company that uh, is uh, in the tech world necessarily. Uh, what they are is a startup studio and seed stage venture capital company based out of New York City. Uh, they invest in network focused consumer facing media businesses. That's what they do. They, they're a hybrid like investor, build a model uh, a type company and that allows them to um, um, invest in a lot of companies, um, um, Groupon, for those of you that know about Groupon, uh, they've invested in Twitter, they've invested in uh, Tumblr and different things like that. So they're kind of an investor builder type um, um, company and they have bought uh, Instapaper. Now according to the report, um, it doesn't look like uh, uh, much is going to change by um, uh, uh, Betaworks buying and, and matter of fact, Betaworks also bought Dig. Uh, back in the day, but it doesn't look like much is going to change um, for uh, 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 Instapaper, so you don't have to worry about that. Those that use it uh, don't have to worry about that because uh, in an email, um, uh, uh, the Betaworks uh, founder and CEO, John uh, Brothwick, remarked that the acquisition clarifies Betaworks' role as a company that builds and operates multiple products rather than just an incubation space for new ideas which eventually get spun out. And more importantly, with uh, Instapaper's purchase model, it makes Betaworks into a company that will actually make money because many people use Instapaper. Uh, um, uh, according to a company a representative, they said starting 14 months ago, they began to move Betaworks uh, into being an operating company. Uh, in our first three years, we were a factory for building companies. We built them and then, you know, spun them out, you know, sold them and hired CEOs and got other people to fund them and stuff like that. And 14 months ago, um, uh, 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 the guy at uh, uh, um, Betaworks said that he paid their investors all their money back and started making a shift to an operating company. So one of the first things they did was go out and buy Instapaper, which they will continue to fund, which they will continue to uh, help grow uh, and bring their uh, wealth of experience uh, behind that. So uh, for companies like Instapaper, that's a, a startup uh, type company. For those of you that like Instapaper out there, that use Instapaper as your read later type device, well, they're now owned by Betaworks, but according to Betaworks, nothing is going to really change. So. You don't have to worry about uh, uh, things changing 
in the uh, beta works, and not in the beta works, in the insta paper world. Now, as we are saying that, Blackberry, we just talked about Blackberry a while ago. Blackberry, matter of fact, before we go on, uh, let, let, let's take a break to, um, 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 to thank one of our uh, event coordinators that uh, we're dealing with. Because you know, um, here at uh, uh, um, Tech Pulse, we have been uh, advertising um, a uh, event planner called Unique Creations by Liz. Uh, she is an event planner, plans everything from um, weddings to uh, birthdays, uh, bar mitzvahs, anything, any kind of event, graduations, and we're coming up on graduation season right now. This is a season where people are graduating and, and getting ready to go on to college and stuff like that. So if you have an event that you want to put on and you don't know what to do, you're like, oh man, what? how am I going to put this thing on? I don't know anything about that. Go and call Unique Creations by Liz. Go to her website, uniquecreationsbyliz.com. Uh, this is where her website right here. These are just some of the things that she's been a part of. The, some of the some of the events that she's uh, helped to put on. Some of the 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 uh, uh, um, events that she's been a part of, and she is uh, sponsoring the fourth annual multicultural showcase called Expressions Caribbean American Exhibition. Uh, it's going to be at June sixth, two thousand thirteen, from five to nine p.m p.m. at the Inverary Vacation Resort, uh, 3501 Inverary Boulevard, Lauder Hill, Florida, 33319. There's going to be great music from soca to R&B to classical, jazz with great saxophonists, a violin duo is going to be there. They're going to be giving away weekend a weekend uh, at the Renaissance Hotel. Several dinners for two are going to be given away, baskets with Caribbean products, gift certificates. There's going to be raffles, show offers. Uh, uh, all kind of food. This is a great uh, event for you to promote uh, your products or service. So if you're a company looking out there to get more exposure, um, give Liz a call and that number is 954-292-6848. Also 954-435-4717. You can become a sponsor. You know, reserve your table, advertise in the Caribbean American Magazine. A great opportunity to promote your business. It's going to be fun. You know, if you just want to come around and just see uh, uh, what's going on, there's going to be uh, lots of vendors, hundreds of people. We at Pulse E Media are going to be there streaming it live. So you can even watch it on My Occasions Live with one S, myoccasionslive.com. And uh, it's just going to be a good time. Parking is free. Um, admission is free. Uh, some of the other sponsors include Auto Nation, Amerijet, Caribbean American Passport, Sea Freight, Ellis Jed, and Bowden Attorneys at Law. I mean, this is going to be an event uh, uh, you won't, you, you, you're not going to want to miss. So, join us on June sixth for Expressions, a Caribbean American uh, uh, exhibition. Uh, we want to thank uh, Liz and Uni Creations for their support of Tech Pulse. Now we're heading back, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, we're gonna talk a little bit about BlackBerry, and uh, there was a, a story a while ago that um, uh, cited that BlackBerry had not received approval from the British government. The British government found several holes in their operating system of the new phone BlackBerry 10. Well, clearly they must have uh, gotten over that because BlackBerry announced that the BlackBerry 10 device has gotten approval by the U.S. <laughs> Defense Department. So BlackBerry is back as far as security is concerned. Um, um, the, the, their operating system for the, the, the Z10 and the Q10 uh, have been approved by the, the, by the Defense Department to be used by the military. Um, the BlackBerry uh, Playbook tablet, if you remember that, with BlackBerry Enterprise Service 10, has also received approval by the U.S. Defense Department. And all three devices can now be used on the DOD, uh, Department of Defense, of Defense Networks. Uh, now, according to a, uh, a spokesperson, they said, BlackBerry 10 is ideal for our government customers because it offers a rich, highly responsive mobile computing experience along with BlackBerry's proven 
and validated security model, a combination that is unmatched in the industry, uh, uh, says uh, 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 the BlackBerry uh, spokesperson. Uh, this approval will enable the DoD customers to connect their BlackBerry Z10s, or if you're in Canada, Z10, uh, and BlackBerry Q10 smartphones to the DoD networks and securely access assets from work while enjoying the wealth of consumer-oriented functionality that the BlackBerry 10 brings to the market. Now, definitely, um, I think this is good news uh, for BlackBerry. Um, Devin, do you think that BlackBerry is now back with their latest approval? They, they had that misstep before, remember, when the British government declined uh, their operating system, but now the U.S. government has said, yes, you are back. I mean, do, do you, is this good for BlackBerry? Um, okay, so I'll answer differently. Yes, it's good for BlackBerry. Are they back? No. No, I don't, I don't think they're back yet. I think they're on the road. They're, this is a good step. They're heading in the right direction. Right. It's, um, it, it verifies their standing in the secure phone activity model. You know, um, like they, they were before. Right. Yeah, so I think it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I like that. Uh, I'm I like to hear that. The yeah, I like to hear that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm rooting for the underdog. Right, right. You know, or the dog. So, but on their heels now, now, I mean, just as BlackBerry, Samsung also submitted their Samsung Galaxy S4 to the U.S. government department for approval. You know, as BlackBerry did, Samsung also did, because there are some phones that are not submitted uh, for approval because uh, uh, companies know they just don't, they don't have the rigorous uh, security uh, uh, so they don't even bother to um, uh, offer it uh, as a uh, form for the government to, uh, to uh, uh, evaluate. But Samsung has given their Galaxy S4 up for government approval. And yes, according to a report, the U.S. Department has also given approval that the Samsung Galaxy S4 can be used on the DoD network. Now, Samsung Galaxy S4, Four uses Samsung's Knox security system that was announced back in, in February of this year when they were doing their whole announcement, the Knox security system, and Samsung will be using it in future devices, which may also get approved for DoD use, such as their Galaxy Note, you know what I'm saying, and uh, on other Galaxy uh, Samsung uh, tablets that they have on the market. Now, Apple's iPhone is apparently also undergoing testing by the DOD um, at the moment. And from what we have, our reports we've said already here on Tech Pulse, where the FBI tried to hack into a conversation that was done on Apple devices, but the Apple encryption code, they could not crack. And they were not able, even with a court order, to break through Apple's security system. And so I don't think Apple is gonna have any uh, problem um, uh, 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 being able to get approval. The Samsung Galaxy S4, as you know, is powered by a, a quad-core 1.9 gigahertz Qualcomm Snapdragon uh, 600 processor, and it comes with uh, Android 4.2.2, Jelly Bean, as you know, the latest version of Jelly Bean, not just Jelly Bean, but their latest updated version, and features a 5-inch full HD Super AMOLED display with a resolution of 920 by 1080, which is 1080p, resolution. Um, other specifications for the device, you know that it has a, uh, a 2600 milliamp um, um, battery. The device also comes with dual cameras, two megapixel front facing camera and a whopping 13 megapixel rear facing camera. Plus it comes in 16, 32 or 64 gigabyte storage uh, capacities with a micro SD card slot for uh, uh, expansion. Now um, the fact that uh, Samsung BlackBerry, now we know that BlackBerry has always um, been used by the government. That was Obama's uh, favorite phone. BlackBerry has been used by the government for a long time. But, and, and we just said that it's a good thing that BlackBerry had received, um, uh, they had received uh, approval by the government because of those of you who have watched Tech Balls before, you know that BlackBerry was turned down by the British government for their Z10 and Z10 um, operating system because they said they found some holes in it. Clearly, BlackBerry has solved those problems, and the U.S. Department of Defense has said that this is a good phone. But on their heels, Samsung also applied for military approval and got it. Apple's iPhone 5 is now currently under 
um, uh, 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 study right now by the DOD, and with that report but from the FBI that we just said about them trying to crack uh, uh, a conversation by uh, two criminals using iPhone devices, and they weren't able to, even with a court order, they weren't able to do it, shows that Apple definitely has uh, uh, some good security measures in there. Now, uh, Devin, do you think that with Samsung's, uh, 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 the role they're on right now, and Apple's reliability as far as, uh, as being, a, a, they're, they're known, their phones are known to be well built and stuff like that. Do you think now that BlackBerry, with their very small market share, you know, their name really not being as prominent as it used to be, do you think this spells trouble uh, for, it's good that they got approval, but the fact that Samsung and Apple are both seeking approval, and Samsung has already gotten it, do you think this is, um, it's like one step forward, two steps back for BlackBerry? That the one step forward, they got approval. Now with Samsung and Apple in the mix, do you think this is, uh, I mean, how, how, how do you read that situation as far as Black? If you were a CEO at BlackBerry, what would you be thinking knowing that Samsung just now, till yesterday received approval, and now Apple is on the table? Resignation. <laughs> that's, that's what I'd be thinking. How fast can I collect severance and all that stuff and get the heck out of there? I don't know. I, <laughs> How fast can I get? Yeah, collect. Can I get that, getting those retirement checks. Correct. Because it's like getting gas. You know, yeah. you go fill up. You're excited. You're going on a journey. Right. The car is washed, ready right, to right. go. You know, you clean it out, spend all day. Yeah. You know, the car looks, looks good, smells, smells good, good, ready to go. Ready to go. You go to the gas station, you know, put gas in there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're just so proud of the of car, what you've got. ready to go. And then this guy pulls up right beside you in a Lamborghini. Yeah. And you thought and you had the car. You had the car. And you thought you were going to be getting the girls <laughs> and the attention. Right, right. You know, smooth. You're smooth. in your, 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 uh, your, what do you call that? Suede shoes. Yeah. Brown. Blue not blue. Shoes. No blue. No, no. That's Elvis. That's that's Elvis. <laughs> Brown suede shoes. Right, right. You know, and your silk. Silk shirts. Yeah, or, yeah. or your, your, your linen shirt. Right. And you're just looking around, proud, you know, yeah, shaking your head, yeah. You know the girls are going to come. And the Lamborghini pulls up, and the guy is three times as handsome as you. <laughs> the car is a hundred times more expensive. Right. And you just, it just kills your day. <laughs> you just want to go to the park somewhere in a shade, just pull up, and just sit there by yourself. <laughs> You don't know what yeah. else to do. You don't do. know what to do. Yeah. You're saying that's what BlackBerry, you would imagine that's what they're feeling right that's now. That's what they're feeling because yeah. they, they, it's a good thing that they did. Right. But you're coming up against Goliath. Yeah. And Again, Goliath. too. Yeah. And Goliath has all that you have. Right. Plus. Plus more. A million more. Right. You know what I'm saying? And then so, Goliath has another friend with yeah. him called Apple. So, I mean, yeah, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's sad. It's, it's sad. good that BlackBerry, because like you say, I like to see a company yeah, like BlackBerry I'm come pulling, back. I'm pulling for them. Yeah, come oh, back. Yeah. But it seems like everything they, they do so far has been, you know, a, a, a misstep of some kind. And, you know, I mean, even right down to the fact that um, uh, 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 they have, uh, remember earlier in the year, they came out with their Z10 and Q10. Yes, we, we know that already. They had the press conference and everything. But the funny part was is a month later, they started uh, uh, giving rumors that they were going to come out with a flagship phone later in the year. You know, so you, you've already hyped the Z10 and the Q10, and then a month later you say, oh, by Christmas time, we're coming up with a flagship phone, by the way. You know, so that was a misstep there. Mm -hmm. And then now they have leaked uh, the BlackBerry R10. It's a QWERTY-style smartphone. Um, that resembles, and we'll show, we'll show the, uh, the viewers a picture of it, it resembles the phone uh, uh, a little bit that they used to have. And it, 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 it looks like they are um, trying to uh, uh, get a cheaper phone uh, on the market with the R10, uh, which, can, which we, we will show you in the, the, the photo. Uh, the R10 features a QWERTY keyboard and, and ha handset that is expected to be priced cheaper than the Q10. You know, and the Z10, you know, it's going to be like their budget phone. 
but um, uh, they they not really uh, giving any indication of price or or exactly when it will come out or any specifications on the phone itself but um, it's rumored to launch sometime in the third quarter now I know Blackberry wants to have units out there they want to have choices they have the Z10 they have the Q10 but obviously they want to have other choices they're trying to build their line you know and they're coming out with this cheaper model I don't know if anybody is going to buy this you you have to be the judge oh uh, when you see this phone right here you have to be the judge I mean uh, if this is the style of phone I mean it's red uh, you know it, it, it's the Blackberry of old with the QWERTY keyboard right there on the front um, are people gonna buy this uh, Blackberry faithfuls may but with what we're just saying with it, it seems like everything Blackberry does um, some other company is doing something to counter I mean Samsung is putting their hat in the ring for government use Apple is putting their hat in the ring and to, to be honest you know what I'm saying I mean Apple is a well-known brand so is Samsung now they're up and coming but you know I mean I can see Blackberry losing out to Apple if Apple gets approval I can see uh, 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 Blackberry uh, possibly losing some of their uh, share to Samsung which is the government isn't used to using Samsung so that might uh, they have a better relationship with Blackberry that might sway Blackberry's way but you know it just seems like everything uh, Blackberry is doing right now it's just not helping them uh, coming out with this cheaper phone I don't know if that's necessarily what they need at this time to uh, bolster sales because there's a lot of cheap phones out there you know so I don't think Blackberry needs to worry about that market I think uh, the Z10 and Q10 are good decent solid phones they need to focus on that area of it but um, you know we're just gonna have to see how this whole thing plays out with Blackberry Samsung and Apple those three are uh, uh, two of them are juggernauts and one of them is just a uh, you know just a scrub trying to uh, uh, trying to trying to get back to where they once were you know so we're gonna have to see but speaking of Apple as we're talking about Apple getting defense contracts Apple also is getting a new app and if you have a desire to be a DJ and you want to be a DJ on the go you know and we're gonna show you a video of this you want to be a DJ on the go um, uh, D, uh, Tractor DJ iPhone app has launched with a pocket full of pocket features for this app. Now, uh, we're talking the Tractor DJ iPhone app has been designed for use with iPhones 4S or 5. So if you have an iPhone 4 or a later, earlier uh, model, uh, it's not uh, designed to work for those phones. Just the iPhone 4S and 5 or the most recent sorry iPod touch um, it can use with but the older iPhone 4 obviously fourth generation um, iPod touch uh, uh, um, may still be supported but um, um, you have to uh, you know you have to check it and see download it if you want to take that risk download it and see if it works with it now uh, this app uh, is available for download uh, in iTunes for $4.99 um, the iPad version is available for uh, $20, $19.99. Um, uh, according to the uh, uh, people who created that, they said it delivers devastating DJ sets using familiar iPhone gestures with beautiful waveforms at your fingertips. Set up your beat grids, cue points, BPM tags on your iPhone to sync with your Tractor Pro setup. Perfectly adapt to the iPhone compact screen uh, uh, estate. The Tractor DJ for iPhone puts personal DJing in the palm of your hand. So we're going to show you a video of this. You, you be the judge if this is something that's worth $4.99 on the iPhone or, or $19.99 if you're going to go the iPad route and you want to be a DJ, you know, you want to test your skills. You know, maybe this is for you. You know, maybe. You, you got to be the judge and see it, but you're seeing it right here first on Tech Pulse. All right. Let's go ahead and bring this up over here, okay? Let's make sure we got sound levels. Sound levels good. Okay, let's see final checks. All right, here we go. Let's go ahead and play this for the masses. Now, you be the judge. Is, is this worth the $4.99 for iPhone or $19.99 for the iPad? Let's check it.
that's a DJ app coming for the iPhone. And apparently uh, that, or that whole demonstration was done with that app. Or the music and everything you heard, all the scratches, all the effects was done with that iPhone app. So uh, for $4.99, if you have an iPhone, uh, uh, or $19.99 if you have a uh, iPad. I mean, if you have an iPad and an iPhone, you can get it uh, for both or, you know, obviously one or the other. But um, this app seems like it's it's something that uh, uh, if, if you're a DJ or you, you, you like to be a DJ or something like that, I mean, for $4.99, you know, it's not that not that bad. Giving you the ability to do all of those uh, scratches and so forth. If you're someone that likes that, well, go ahead and try out that app that has been released in the iTunes Store uh, right now. So if you didn't know that app existed, now you do. If your uh, uh, goals were to be a DJ or you want to be a closet DJ, you want to just test around and see what you can do without all the big expensive equipment, you just want an app to do it, you might want to check that out. Now, speaking of stuff you need to check out, um, according to a report by Geeky Gadgets, Google Hangout updates adds remote desktop control. So for those of you who have um, uh, 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 Google Hangouts and Google Plus, um, according to them, if you need to access other computers to troubleshoot uh, issues with your family, uh, members, friends, stuff like that, business colleagues, whatever, you might be pleased to learn that Google has rolled out this service. They call it, it's Google's Google Hangouts uh, Google Plus service that now allows you to control another desktop. Now the Google Hangouts remote desktop control enables you to play tech support for your friends and family. You know, a lot of times, and I, I know Devin, you have this one person that, uh, that used to call you a lot for tech advice. You know, she got his new computer and you know, she didn't know how really to uh, uh, operate it and had a lot of questions. And uh, uh, you, uh, you use something uh, called uh, Team Viewer, all right, to uh, gain access to the computer and stuff like that. Well, if she has a Google account and you, know, you have a Google account, Google Hangouts for most desktop enables you to play tech support. You can get into that person's computer with family and friends. They said uh, uh, it's powered by the same technology behind um, the Chrome remote desktop. It allows you to gain access to your friend's computer and uh, you know troubleshoot it and do what you would normally do uh, um, if you uh, wanted to fix it. According to a person at Google, they say Hangouts remote desktop lets you help others by controlling their computer remotely. Obviously, you have to get their permission just like you do with any uh, of those services. And because you're both in Hangout, if you both, you know, have, like I say, you have the Google Hangout uh, account, you can talk with and see each other during the session. You know, so it's not just, you know, you're over the phone and, you know, you, you can't, you know, you're just talking over the phone. This allows you to use Google Talk to not only call, but you can use your phone's camera, not your phone, your computer's camera to, to uh, them to see you, you to see them, and you can just, uh, uh, you know, take control of their computer. I mean, uh, th these big companies seem to just be coming out with these little improvements and things that really are practical. I mean, do you see this as something that people will actually use? You know, I mean, because a lot of times you're talking to someone and they know how to fix the problem. Maybe they're not a techie, but they know how to fix the problem you might have. And rather than saying, oh man, can you, oh man, if I was just there, I could tell you, you know, some, uh, and uh, uh, it doesn't work trying to explain things to people that are not techy. When you're on the phone, you're saying, do this, do that. It, it just doesn't work, you know. But if you can gain access through Google Plus using Google Hangouts, because they added that feature just yesterday. They have announced that they're adding that feature uh, 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 in Google Hangouts. So, Devin, do you think this is something that um, uh, regular people are going to use? I see it as a handy love tool. It, love it, love it, love it. I, yeah. I, I mean, this is, that's why I love tech folks. Oh, yeah. This is good stuff. I mean, you don't know how useful this tool is until you've used them and know how, you know, my mom is working on finding something, doing something. Right. I can just get her on the way. Up and it's running, fun. yeah. Log writing, you know, one, two, three. One, it's two, three. Great. It's great. It's exactly. And so for those of you watching Tech Pulse and you want to know, man, how can I, how can I get this? We're going to tell you right here, right now. So grab a pen and paper or whatnot, you know, get something so you can write this down. All you, to get started, 
You just have to ha um, start uh, um, a Hangout, you know, uh, uh, in Google Plus. You start a Hangout. Um, you click uh, View More Apps in the Hangout. Then click Add Apps. And then click Hangout Remote Desktop. You know, once you do that, everything should be uh, uh, set up and you should be good to go. So, you know, give us that feedback. Uh, let, let us know. You tried it out. Let me go over it again. You go, you start a Hangout. You go to view more apps, then you click add apps, then click hangout remote, remote desktop. So uh, 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 let us know what you think. I mean, hit us up in the chat room. Uh, uh, Devin, what, what, what's the email and, and uh, uh, how can they get in the chat room if they want to comment uh, on next text post about how they, they use this service? Yeah, just, just go to the site and um, right below the viewer, uh, the, the TV screen is the chat room if you don't see it. Just put your cursor over the screen and you'll see a pop-up that says chat. Um, just click on that and go down to the chat room. We like to know, even if you have a nickname or something, put your nickname in so we know who we're talking to. Right. Uh, rather than guess 1,256,000, <laughs> you know, something like that. So give us a, a holler in the chat room or you can call us right into the studio at 954-323-8355. Nine five four three two three eight three five five. We'd love to hear from you. And even if you don't catch the show live, call us afterwards. Call us when you're watching it. Leave a message. We'll check in on on that message, and we will talk about it the next opportunity. There you go. So though that's what we're talking about. If you're someone that is um, uh, looking to, uh, you know, spice up your your Google account and you want to do different things, hey, just go ahead and go to uh, Google Hangouts uh, and, and uh, download that service and just let us know what you think. You know, uh, I'm sure all of us have friends and family or coworkers or whatever that, you know, look to us for advice when it comes to tech. And sometimes they, they ask you something and you know it's so simple to you, but to explain it, it's just, you just don't know how to do that, you know, and not in a way they will understand anyway. And so this just gives you the perfect opportunity if you both have Google Plus accounts, you know, and, and uh, you're in Hangout, you can not only uh, take remote control of that computer using this new uh, feature, but you can also um, uh, see them, you can also talk with them, and everything is just, it's just a, 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 a good thing that you can do. Now, um, we're gonna take uh, another quick break to talk about uh, uh, healthy eating and living. Now, I know that uh, a lot of us, you know, Eating healthy is something that we all try to do, but sometimes, you know, it, it can be a challenge. It can be a challenge trying to eat healthy, but we have to remember that if we want to, uh, we all going to pay health care one way or the other, whether we pay it up front or on the back end. And if you want to stay healthy, visit ultimateorganics.net. Yes, ultimateorganics.net, over 11,000 products ready to go from uh, 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 makeup uh, 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 supplies to um, beauty supplies to um, uh, uh, pet food, uh, 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 protein drinks, uh, snacks, obviously human food, you know, everything in the organic world made with 100% organic material, not made with, uh, you know, uh, uh, chemical lab material that you can't pronounce. These are natural organic material. You're looking for cereals, you're looking for condiments, pure olive oil, all of that stuff made from natural, earth-grown, 100% uh, 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 um, ingredients. You're looking for, for uh, cleaning products. You're looking for aerosols for the house without all those chemicals. You're allergic to different things. These are natural botanical uh, uh, air fresheners and cleaners uh, and stuff like that. Visit ultimateorganics.net if you want that 100% organic food uh, or products, and we like to thank them for their support of Tech Pulse. All right, we're back, and we're talking now. Uh, yesterday we had a story talking about how AOL, AOL on, had just signed um, a deal with various stars like Sarah Jessica Parker, uh, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, uh, and others like that, and uh, um, uh, an Anderson guy. I can't remember his uh, first name. But Anthony Anderson, I think it is, he, uh, they signed deals with them for 15 new 
uh, uh, shows, original content that they're going to be bringing to AOL On. Now, um, if you don't know what AOL On is, AOL On is a streaming service for AOL. Remember AOL, you've got mail. Remember that? That's AOL. And they now have a streaming service that brings digital content to people. This is all part of that streaming uh, uh, content to people when they want, where they want, on uh, code cutter um, uh, movement that's going on right now. Well, YouTube, uh, obviously Google, YouTube has uh, 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 seen all of this. And YouTube, Google, they've said uh, they have their own uh, ad pitch and they're saying that they want people, instead of signing up like AOL on did, signing up Hollywood stars, YouTube is saying, don't sign up Hollywood stars. Sign up our stars, the YouTube channel stars. Yeah, I mean, last year, YouTube gathered advertisers for a splashy event in New York in the hopes of getting marketers to move their dollars from uh, TV to the world's biggest video site, which is YouTube. Uh, uh, and then last night, yesterday, uh, YouTube tried the same thing, but changed its pitch. Instead of trying to convince buyers that YouTube stuff is as good as what's on TV, you know, because uh, that's what the, they were going before, they said now that YouTube is now arguing that the stuff people watch on YouTube is better than the stuff they're watching on TV because they're watching it on YouTube. That's what YouTube has said. They're saying that the stuff is better than TV because you're watching it on YouTube. And they're saying, since that's the case, you need to bring your advertising dollars over to us. So for AOL on, they're saying that, why would you hire a Gwyneth Paltrow? Why would you hire an Anthony Anderson? Why would you hire a Sarah Jessica Parker when we have bona fide YouTube stars that can give you better you know, uh, uh, entertainment value? Gone from last year, YouTube's effort to push its funded channel program where it handed out, uh, I think, like hundreds of millions of dollars in an attempt to get more professional content. They were trying to do that. But we here at Tech Pulse have proven that people who stream, people who are in this cord cutter mentality, they don't want things to look as polished as an NBC. They like being able to feel like they can be a part of this situation. And that's what YouTube found out after they dumped hundreds of millions of dollars in a campaign trying to get their programming to look more professional. Now, Devin, before I, I, I even go on more about this story, what do you think about the fact that a, a, a bona fide company like YouTube dumped last year hundreds of millions of dollars into trying to get their programming to look like NBC when companies like ours, we're thinking that we don't want our content to look like NBC because we're not NBC. We're Pulse E-Media. We want to make this content look accessible to the general and common man. And YouTube, a billion dollar company, has realized that. And so now they're saying to the AOL ons and to the Netflixes and stuff like that, don't look to hire Hollywood stars. Hire our stars because we are Google. I mean, what do you think about that? Do you think that, that um, Google is thinking too much of YouTube? I mean, what have they gotten right in that statement? And what have they gotten wrong in, in, in that statement that they're saying? Because they're saying that our stars, the YouTube channel stars, that's who you want to get. If you're going to be bringing original content, forget about Sarah Jessica Parker. Forget about Anthony Anderson. Forget about those deadbeats in Hollywood. They don't have it. Who has it? We at Google. We have it. Because they tried well, to make their stuff their more. Statement, right? huh? mean, that's their statement. Yeah, but well, that's fine. You can talk all the way I mean, you know, no. I, <laughs> if, if it was something where they were going to now restrict, you know, right. and, and make consequences out of the fact that they're not using YouTube stars, right. you know, then I'd worry about it. Right. They can puff up their chest and beat up, you know. And, and beat Tarzan like all they want, huh? I like YouTube. Yeah. We use YouTube. Right. Come on, be realistic. You know, that's, that's kind of far-fetched. You know? <laughs> that, that, forget about Hollywood, that they, yeah. you know, that and they are the only people that you should really be courting. Yeah. And I, I don't even think people really uh, consider YouTube stars as legitimate stars. Right. And, I mean, yeah, I, there shouldn't be any distinction, per se. Right. However, the fact is that they hold them differently. Right. I mean, they, they don't have the same celebrity status. No, no. 
as the Hollywood stars. No way, not not even close. Whether it's deserved or not. Right. Not the but the point is, they just don't have that. Don't have right. It. But one thing I liked with YouTube understood after spending hundreds of millions, they realized that the streaming audience is different, different than the audience that is NBC. It's a different audience, and they don't want the content to look the same as NBC. And, and it took them hundreds of millions to realize that, that they don't want that. And so now they're saying, AOL on that's coming up with these reality shows, hey, we're the king of reality. You know what I'm saying? You need to hire all stars, but I think that Hollywood is recognizing that as well. That's why they're accepting AOLs like, like the Anthony I'm Anderson and the Quentin Faltrow. I'm surprised that, that YouTube didn't get that from the beginning. From the get-go. Yeah, I right. mean, at my small brain and my limited research uh, information just told me that it's a different kind of production. Right. You know? People like the rawness of YouTube. Yeah. The un uncultured, the the yeah, just the, the simpleness. The unedited. The unedited yeah. rawness of it. And, yeah. You know this formatted, you know scripted scripted thing. Mm. People are going to watch it. Right. But that's not why they're on YouTube. People no. are not on YouTube to see. You know, regular show. Exactly. They want, they want this kind of irreverent. Right. Um, you know. <laughs> Something that people just put up. And, and it helps them to feel a part yeah, yeah. of the community more than Absolutely. watching the Hollywood. Absolutely. You Absolutely. see? And so it, it's, it's too bad it took YouTube hundreds of millions to realize that. You know that. what's interesting? I, I have a sneaky feeling that people like the difference and they like to tune in to culture TV. Right. And CNNs and the NBC to get a certain kind of information. Right. And then they like to go to YouTube. They like to have that option. And get the other kind of exactly. information. Exactly, exactly. You know, that, that in the back of their mind, they're going, this could probably not be real. This is <laughs> probably just, you know, for fun. Right. You know, and, and that's how they want to keep it. So, right now. Anyway. Right now, anyway. And, and that's the thing. And, and the good thing about it is, is that I think what uh, our networks aren't realizing is networks were used to having the monopoly on content. When it came to content that we watch, content that we consume, they were used to having a monopoly on it. Now the streaming world has come out, the companies like Hulu and Netflix, AOL on, as well as Amazon Prime, uh, uh, um, um, Google TV, all of these uh, uh, devices, Apple TV, uh, on Netgear, all of these these companies have come out with streaming devices that have digital content on them that is on demand. You could watch it whenever you want, and that is what has shifted the model. And uh, 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 the big um, the big companies are not used to that. They're not used to having to share their space with anybody, and so now. When companies like Google come out with uh, YouTube, and, you know, people want to see the differences. People don't want to just, I mean, there was a time when all we knew was polished TV. That's all we knew, so we watched it. But when uh, YouTube came around and they started, you know, people started putting up, you know, the home videos or something crazy, you know, and it went viral, everyone was watching it. That's when people started realizing that there is a different market. As a matter of fact, MTV, if many of you uh, re uh, remember MTV with the real world, back in the days, they were the first to come out with this reality-based television where they put people in a room and just see what they would do. And that was wildly popular on MTV. The regular networks really didn't see the, the profit in it yet, but over time, reality TV started being uh, a mainstream. That's so why you have like the survivors and... Uh, 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 you know, um, all these other reality shows, like Amazing Race and all these other shows, Survivor, that, that, that have come up. And, but what has happened is Hollywood still wanted some production value. They still wanted to add a little bit of their edited feel in it. It, it started out raw, but they wanted to add a little bit of their edited feel in there and, and scripted words and try to make jokes where there's none and stuff like that. So it took the edge off of what they call reality TV. And now when you had companies like YouTube to come out and they just uh, allow people to upload personal videos, whatever you, you shot or whatnot, just real stuff, people started having a liking to it and that's why YouTube has grown to such uh, proportions. But the stars that are on YouTube are in no way 
uh, the same as the stars that are in Hollywood, but I just think it's different flavors, different flavors. You like Italian, you also like Chinese. You see, different flavors of food. You're not gonna say, well, I only want Italian or I only want Chinese. You want both, just at different times, and I think that's what's happening here. That's what's happening here. People don't mind the polished TV. They don't mind that. They just want the option of being able to have uh, 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 polished TV and then have streaming TV. And now with companies like Netflix that are allowing you to see polished TV through streaming TV, that's where the lines are starting to be blurred. So it's going to be interesting now as time goes on to see what happens in that world. Is Google going to uh, be able to sell its stars to other online, uh, uh, to other streaming uh, networks like um, Hulu, when Hulu comes out with their series, Netflix was wildly popular with House of Cards, who, who knows what other series they have in the works, who, who they're gonna hire um, for stuff like that. But what I do know is that they're not gonna hire Hollywood people necessarily if they can't get them at a budget price because the whole point of streaming over the internet is to keep costs down to give people that cheaper alternative. Netflix has uh, uh, $7.99 a month. You see, $7.99 a month for their service and you get all their digital content, all their original shows and everything. So if they're gonna charge only $7.99 a month, they can't get Hollywood actors that are gonna demand big money. They have to get these low, no name uh, uh, restaurant waitresses, type actresses, you know, these are the people who they're going to seek out. These are the talents they're going to seek out and, and garner and encourage and stuff like that. So it's going to be good to see. And speaking of downloads and download uh, streaming and all of that, we've been talking about Google with their Google Fiber service. Their Google Fiber has been going on a tear. First, they started out in Kansas. Then they came to um, um, uh, 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 the next city was um, um, Austin, Texas. And then... They next uh, 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 is uh, they're gonna be uh, setting up in Utah. Now uh, companies are, are starting to to realize this, and a new company called Cyberlink is going to start providing gigabit internet service in Omaha, Nebraska. Now it, it seems like you know all of these people are getting gigabit internet, except you know big places like California, like um, um, uh, 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 Florida, in Miami, and so forth. But when it comes to gigabit internet, the headline buzz usually involves Google, you know, uh, uh, because they're the ones that's really pushing their Google Fiber. And, and some uh, 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 mid or southwestern American uh, locale where Google is going to go. But Cyberlink, have, uh, 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 Cyberlink has announced that they're going to bring this ridiculously high-speed internet to Omaha, Nebraska, where uh, uh, they are launched for a pilot, you know, they're, they're, they're primed for a pilot uh, service. Starting Monday, according to the company, um, the Telco's uh, light speed broadband package, it's going to start for uh, $80 a month um, as a bundle. If you, if you bundle their package with, um, I guess, cable or, or phone or whatever, it's going to be $80 a month. If you just want the standalone internet service, that's it. You don't want TV. You don't want anything like that. Then it's going to cost $150 for a standalone service. And they will go live in, uh, for nearly 10,000 subscribers and continue to roll out a footprint just shy of 50,000 residential and enter enterprise uh, uh, subs by October. Further expansion plans for the greater uh, metro area all hinge upon whether Cy CenturyLink, not CyberLink, sorry, CenturyLink can turn a profit on the service. But the company will continue to sign up enterprise subs outside this pilot zone for the next uh, two years, I think they said. Also, the path forward, at least for us, uh, is pretty clear. You know, the Omaha people vote. Uh, we'll have to vote with their wallets as to whether the gigabyte internet service uh, uh, thing is really going to stick in that town. Now, I mean, when I look at these, uh, you know, Google going to Kansas, and then they went to Austin, Texas, and then they went to, to, to Palo, uh, um, um, Utah, and now CenturyLink, you know, in Omaha, Nebraska. I mean, uh, Devin, do you think that going in these small markets, I mean, I understand 
that you don't want to, uh, you know, you don't want to waste money and stuff like that. But I mean, is it a wise move for these companies to go in these smaller markets where um, you may not have as many uh, people interested in gigabyte internet? They may not really, they might be fine with, with what they have. I mean, I went to college in Nebraska and I know that there's, that technology is there, yes, yeah, sure, but the people there are more laid back. The people there are not on the go every second like they are in Florida, like they are in New York, like they are in, in, in some parts of Boston and Chicago and those big metropolitan in Los Angeles and those big metropolitan cities. You know, uh, so you, the, 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 the response to gigabyte internet may not be as, as readily accepted as if they were in some of these big markets. Now, one could argue that if it works there, then definitely it's gonna work anywhere, but what do you think, uh, I mean, as a, as, as a CEO uh, yourself, what do you think the thinking is with Google, with Cyberlink, with these other people that's trying to provide gigabit inter internet? Now, we're all for gigabit internet, because right now, you know, the average uh, speeds here in America, the average speed, is 1.4 megabits per second. That's the average uh, nationwide um, speed you get for the internet, 1.4 megabits. Uh, these companies are offering 1,000 megabits per second uh, internet speed. So uh, what do you think the, um, uh, the, the thinking is behind starting in these smaller markets? Because I would think that if you're going to make a push for gigabit internet, you want to push it to the people that would really have a use for it, some people that would really uh, uh, use it, um, like in the, the New Yorks, like in the Miamis, like in the um, uh, 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 Los Angeles, those areas. Starting out in, in Kansas, you know, and then going to, to Palo, Utah, and now Omaha, Nebraska. What, what do you think they're thinking with these markets? Well, there, there might be two strategies that they're looking at. One is the, the volume is controllable. Right. And, uh, you know, there's, lower risk or less risk in terms of issues um, and my thing is up yeah so <laughs> yeah let me let me repeat that so i think yeah i think it's maybe two strategies that they're employing and right. and right. one is uh, the volume would pose a lower risk level in terms of issues right. coming up which means that you can turn that high uh, positive feedback right. you know as the risk level of people having issues with it and um you can turn that into a promotional thing because right. when people get a good feedback they're, they're likely to 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 also participate in it, right? right so that's one thing the other thing is just the fact that it's much more manageable when you roll in it out slowly market. in increments and right. um you know the, the the demand when you say i'm rolling it out in a family of five right? right then you know what your resources are and you can manage that family of five right. versus if you roll it out in la and everybody's calling you every week going it's is it here yet is right, it here right. yet is right, it here right, yet right, and you right. know you can't get it there right you know i would not be surprised if they're already rolling it out in other major cities right. but it's not a public knowledge thing right nobody right. knows that it's being rolled out they're gonna just come you know a few months down the road and say by the way it's available now in la right right because they've already tested it they've already they tested were, it yeah and, yeah, yeah. And everything so, is in place so yeah i mean i mean it's one of those things where the, the the natural reaction you know like like what i'm thinking is that you know if you want to test this thing you got to go in the bigger markets but like what Devin is saying is that that would be fine but at the same time, you, when you're doing a test, you really want to be able to control the situation. And in a, such a big market like LA, like a Miami, like a New York, like a Chicago, it's just going to be too much for them to be able to, um, you know, to, to, to roll it out. And then you have people calling you, like you say every day, hello, yeah, something is wrong, or this isn't working, or that isn't working. If they can go in a smaller market of just a few thousand people, then if something goes wrong, it's easier for them to fix it's easier to, for them to get that feedback that they need to uh, do the things that they need to, to make this thing viable. So, yeah, I totally understand. I totally understand uh, the, the mindset behind 
wanting to go to these smaller markets first. Now, obviously, uh, as a uh, tech individual, do I like it? No, because I want to have gigabit internet, especially when you're getting average speeds of only 1.4 megabits, and that's if it's not shared. That's if you have, you know, you have most of the resources. But if you're not getting most of the resources, if you're at a peak moment, at a peak time, whether you're at night or, or you know, like after work or lunchtime, whatever, whatever is a peak moment in your area, you're going to get much less than 1.4 um, uh, megabits. I mean, we've gotten speeds as slow as like 700 kilobits per second. You know, we've gotten speeds as slow as that because we're, we're using it during a peak moment. And, you know, for uh, Policy Media, we do broadcasts, we do live events. You know, we need uh, uh, that type of gigabit internet service for really to, to have that, that smooth streaming and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I totally understand what uh, 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 um, these companies are doing when they decide that, you know what, we're going to start off in these smaller markets just so they can control. It's all about being able to control what's going on, not control it in a bad way. But being able to control the uh, uh, being able to control the production process, because if they can't control that, if they're not able to control how things come out, they're not able to control like uh, uh, especially if they're they're troubleshooting and wanting to find the best way to do things. Then you know th th this is the way they have to do it. It's just for people like us in these bigger uh, markets in these bigger areas, and we see the potential of gigabit internet. It's, it's kind of hard to sit back while these smaller markets are getting all the tests and, and so forth. And, uh, you know, but hey, we just got to wait like everybody else who doesn't have gigabit internet. But when it comes, I'm telling you, that's going to change everything. Download speeds, uh, watching streaming, things like Netflix. I mean, just instant on, just like that. You turn it on, you run, you, you boot up Netflix, boom. That's it right there. You know, Netflix is boosted. Netflix is ready to go. I mean, it's going to be something to, 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 to be seen. So um, we're going to definitely watch this gigabit internet. And that's why ever since the first inception of, of Kansas City to Austin, Texas, we brought it right here on Tech Pulse. So you're going to know if you're in those areas, you're watching us in one of those areas, you're in Texas, Austin, Texas, you're getting that gigabit internet. You're in, 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 in Palo or Pablo uh, 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 Utah. You're getting gigabit, and now Omaha, Nebraska will be getting in gigabit internet. Uh, they're rolling that thing out Monday. Uh, 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 so for those of you that uh, 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 know about CenturyLink, they're rolling that thing out Monday, 10,000 10, subscribers, they say. So go ahead and call them up. I mean, $80, that's comparable to what Google is offering. For They're offering $70 for uh, their gigabit uh, internet service. I, don't, I, I, I think that comes um, bundled with uh, TV. Uh, I'm not sure if that's their standalone price, but I know they have also standalone as well as bundling and so forth. So this is something that really is going to change the way not only you watch TV, but you use your computers and everything like that. So we want to just keep on top of that as we go. Now, let's move over to a totally different story. This one is talking about Intel. Now, if we... If you have been watching Tech Pulse, you know that uh, uh, AMD recently announced their new processor line, you know, and Intel has also been talking about their Haswell uh, processors, which is supposed to be a more energy efficient type processor. Intel said they weren't really necessarily going for a better speed or more power, but they were more focusing on... Uh, 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 performance because they you know, you know the world of, of mobile computing is getting bigger and bigger and also they're having trouble um, um, getting into that mobile market which is uh, dominated by Nvidia by Qualcomm those uh, chip makers have dominated the uh, 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 tablet and uh, smartphone market mostly because their processors are able to run more efficiently uh, than Intel which was generally a laptop and desktop processors well Intel details on their fourth generation core um, HD 5000 Iris and Iris Pro graphics, they say is up to three times faster than the processors they have now. Now, you may already believe that the real highlight of Intel's fourth generation core processor lineup would be a giant 
graphics update, you know, that's what they're gonna go for. But Intel uh, reveal that, uh, uh, that they're right, and importantly, that they're uh, an equally large, there's an equally large shift in uh, the naming strategy that they're using for their chips. Well, where the third generation core graphics were divided into two tiers. Uh, the new generation is focused on three, two of which are built for performance over per, uh, efficiency. Um, Ultrabooks with uh, like 15 uh, watts uh, U-series pr processors will use comparatively uh, uh, um, ordinary, if still faster, HD uh, 5000 graphics. And then uh, thin and light laptops with like 28 uh, watts uh, U-series chips get the new tier iris that Intel claims is up to twice as fast in 3D as last year's HD uh, graphics processors. Now, power-hungry parts uh, will see even more boosts. They can carry Iris Pro graphics with embedded uh, uh, D uh, 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 DRAM memory, uh, which should double 3D speed on 8-series mobile chips. Are you talking 47 to 55 um, watts of typical power and triple it for the R series to around 65 to 84 watts on desktops. Um, they say they also, uh, we also know that the, the M series uh, laptop and the K series desktop CPUs will have pro options. So the Iris Pro option, they're gonna have that. And for the future set, for the graphics trio is slightly more familiar uh, uh, to most people, although there are also a few tricks up Intel's sleeves. So they're not letting us know everything. All three can draw direct X 11.1 and OpenGL 4 visuals, as well as take on open CL 1.2 computing and faster media processing. So. Um, uh, uh, they're also saying that along with that, along with received, in, in, uh, with the specs we just announced, they're going to have enhanced 4K output. The new core graphics can handle on three screen uh, collage mode and we won't need uh, a dedicated video for large multi-monitor uh, canvases. So uh, uh, Intel isn't providing uh, any more than incidental details about how the process themselves, although it already uh, uh, you know, gave us a little teaser, uh, we'll get the full story of these processes and what they can do in early June. But for right now, based on what I just uh, uh, told you right there, you might say, well, uh, you told me a lot of stuff. I don't understand half of it. Let me it just break it down to you. The new generation of, graph, uh, of, of Intel chips. What we thought was that Intel, the Haswell series that they're coming out with was going to be purely uh, 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 efficiency based in terms of they're just gonna come out with chips that are going to last longer and, 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 and uh, use less power so your battery life can last longer. Intel has said based on what I just told you, all of that means that they have been able to enhance uh, uh, some chips they're going to use for purely power, and then some they're going to bridge the gap to give you power and performance. They'll not just have one or the other, but you have, um, like they did with their Core i3s, you know, their Core i3s and the, the, the first, gener first and second generation Core i5 chips were just dual core. Dual core chips, uh, depending on the speed that they ran at, but they didn't really do much, so they were just low power chips. Their, their mid-range was the, was the uh, 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 Core i5 that they had hyper-threading and turbo, uh, 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 turbo boost in the Core i5, which allowed it to, be, to act as a virtual four-core. Now, remember, we talked about virtual before. So virtual four-core, and then that turbo boost kicked in if the processor needed a little bit extra power. But their granddaddy, the big boy, series of processor was always their core i7 series which always was quad core with hyper threading and turbo technology so for the heavy processing they always had the core i7 for the light uh, uh processing it was core i3 you know a little mid-range core i5 but with these new haswell chips it's either going to be built for performance you're going to have like core i7 or you're going to have core i7 but 
without, let's say, the, um, the hyperthreading or without the turbo boost, you know, uh, uh, but still able to perform uh, 4K and, 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 and deal with 4K resolution. So you're not going to have this, this shift of being able to have some process. If I buy this processor, I can only do this. Intel's new chips are set for performance and efficiency in, uh, uh, with these new Haswell chips. They haven't let out all the specs. They're, in June, they're really going to roll out exactly what they plan on doing and how they plan on doing it with their chips. We're gonna learn more then, but as for right now, that's what they're releasing and that's what it looks like these Haswell chips are going to provide. They're going to provide us with the ability to have performance as well as efficiency. And that, I mean, that is a smart move by Intel because when you have tablets being such an important part of the market today, tablets, I mean, I have, I have a matter of fact, we're, uh, we're, 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 we have a report on, on how tablets are, are really doing in the market today. But when you have tablets that are coming out at record pace and more and more people deciding to go with tablets over um, desktops or, uh, and even over ultrabooks and things like that, a lot of people are deciding that they're just going to go with tablets because they're portable and people using their smartphones and, and, and smartphone and tablets are a market that Intel has been trying to crack for a long time. But tablet makers and phone makers have been hesitant because Intel's chips were all about uh, uh, either performance, which they didn't give you much, or they uh, 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 were about power, which just ate your battery life. And uh, chips from NVIDIA and chips from Qualcomm have uh, uh, consistently proven to tablet makers that those are the chips that uh, they want uh, in their machines because they want to have uh, the ability for people to have 10 hour battery life when it comes to their, uh, when it comes to their um, uh, um, tablets. Nobody wants to have a tablet that's only going to last three hours, a tablet that's going to last you know, four hours. That's what you hear with laptops. But when you have a tablet, you want a tablet that's going to last you all day. That's what you're looking for. You're not looking for a tablet that's going to last you a few hours and then conk out. Or your phone is going to give you a couple of hours of, of uh, usable uh, use and then conk out. And that's what the NVIDIAs, that's what the Qualcomms have been known to be able to uh, provide tablet makers with. Chips that don't use up a lot of power but are powerful in and of themselves, giving people the opportunity to have their computing on the go. So the fact that Intel is using this, uh, their Haswell uh, uh, processes to really try and bridge that gap, we have to see now if the Samsungs, if the, um, um, the Asus's, if the Acer's, you know what I'm saying, the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, Blackberries, the Toshiba's, if these companies, HP, uh, release their tablets late, if these companies are going to go with Qualcomm, Nvidia, or if they're going to switch over, to the new um, uh, uh, Haswell chips that Intel is bringing out. So we're gonna uh, see, uh, wait and see. And with that in mind, this is what Intel is looking at, uh, why I think that they're uh, really trying to beef up their Haswell processor line, because according to a report by USA Today, tablets shipments have soared in the first quarter. Uh, uh, consumers just don't seem to be able to get enough of uh, tablets uh, uh, this year so far, global shipments of uh, uh, tablets, according to the report, have doubled during the first quarter of this year. Uh, 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 they say that more than 49.2 million tablets were shipped during the first quarter of 2013. That's up 142% from the same time last year. It also uh, is more than the number of tablets shipped in the first half of 2012, so in the first half of 2012, they didn't ship 49.2 million tablets. Now, as far as how this thing breaks down, Apple obviously uh, continues to dominate. They shipped 19.2 uh, million iPads worldwide um, in the first quarter. That's more than double, uh, 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 more than uh, twice that of the second place finisher, which is Samsung. Um, however, Apple uh, leads the market share as uh, has closed from 58.2% during the first quarter of 2012 to only 39.6%. Uh, meanwhile, Samsung has jumped 
uh, uh, to 17.9% of the tablet market share, not smartphone now, tablet market share from 11.3% uh, last year. Now, Nexus 7 uh, uh, manufacturer, uh, Asus and Kindle Fire and stuff like that, makers uh, uh, um, Amazon and Microsoft with its line of Surface tablets uh, rounded out the top five. So we had Nexus 7, then you had Asus, Kindle Fire, uh, the makers of uh, uh, Amazon who, who makes Kindle Fire, and then Microsoft um, rounded out uh, the top five in terms of tablets for this year. But with that growth, with tablet shipments soaring and tablet shipments really being uh, 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 going up in uh, this year, I really see that this is why uh, Intel, this, this is why Intel is really choosing to come up with their Haswell processes because they see that the tablet market is not a market that's going away anytime soon. People use tablets all the time. People use uh, uh, yes, they use laptops and stuff like that, but tablets are just more port portable. Tablets are easier to carry, you know, and the, 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 the boot up time is much less than uh, the boot up time of a laptop. And if Intel wants to really get a piece of that market share when it comes to tablets and smartphones, they're going to have to build chips that will last all day. People can't be constantly plugged in like they can with or they expect to be with their laptops and so forth. When they have tablets, they, they're looking to, to be cordless. They're looking to be wireless and be able to use full functions on their tablets, full functions on their smartphones without having to worry about their battery dying or, or running out of, 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 uh, running out of um, uh, uh, power before the end of the day. So if, uh, if, if, if uh, Intel really wants to get a part of this uh, market, they really want to get a part of this market, then I think that they really don't have too much of a choice, in my opinion, um, if they're going to uh, uh, make it. They really don't have a choice but to come out with these, uh, you know, with these new, um, with these new um, 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 uh, processes. They have to be able to come out with these processes that, you know, is going to help them to compete, basically help them compete, you know, in today's uh, world. So uh, we're just going to have to see how these things uh, uh, just, uh, you know, how these things play out. Now, if you're looking for a way, you know, to make your, because uh, we said this on uh, uh, Tech Pulse before, if you're looking for a way to make your regular HDTV smart, there's a number of options coming out. You know, because a lot of us, we weren't able to buy, uh, I mean, to buy a smart HDTV, LED, and all of that can be expensive. You know, easily over $1,000, 1400 if you're looking for, you know, a good 50, 55 inch, and stuff like that. However, you could probably get a 60 inch for under 1000 maybe eight ninety nine. a 60 inch, just regular, no, not a smart TV, just a regular TV, 60 inch, probably for eight ninety nine. you know, uh, something like that. If you're going to Best Buy and you're looking to get it, even like a, a brought back one, a used one, you could probably pick one of those up easy for what? Uh, uh, you know, if it's if brought back, you probably pick it up for five ninety nine. you know, saying six ninety nine. And so, you know, but having that internet, having, having the ability to be able to surf the web and stuff like that is something that people want. Well, if you want to transform your non-smart HDTV into a smart HDTV, Here's another device for you. It's called the iMeto MX1 Android Home Media Center. Uh, uh, that just might be worth your while. Now, the, the iMeto um, MX1 is powered by a dual core, and we're going to show you a picture of this thing. It's not a big uh, uh, box. It's not even as big as a Roku. Roku it's, it's basically the size of a thumb drive. It's powered by a dual core 1.6 gigahertz Cortex A9 processor with a quad core graphics Mali 400 supporting 1080p video at a resolution of 1920 by 1080 supported by one gigabyte of DDR3 RAM and eight gigabytes of on internal onboard storage. Now the iMeto uh, MX1 is also fitted with uh, Wi-Fi 802.11 BGN and 10 uh, uh, um, um, 100 megabits 
uh, per second. Uh, connectivity and comes supplied running Google. Google. It, it comes supplied running Google's Android 4.1. Yes, that is Jelly Bean operating system with access to the Google Play Android App Store and features support for Adobe Flash 11. And guess what? The best thing is this thing only costs sixty dollars if you go to uh, Amazon or whatnot. It only costs sixty bucks to get this thing. So if you're looking to turn your, your TV into a smart TV where you can surf the web, where you can uh, 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 download um, 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 apps on the web, you can download apps from the Google Play Store to your TV. You can download certain things from the web. You know, uh, you can surf the web uh, 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 using uh, the Android operating system. You know, and using Google Play, you, you got Google Search right there uh, with, a, with a quad core, I mean, with a, with a dual core process in it. So if you're looking so that you don't always have to run to your computer, you know what I mean? Because sometimes, you know, uh, uh, you don't always want to have to use your computer to, um, um, use your computer to um, uh, 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 get online. You're watching TV, you're looking at, at, at somebody uh, on TV and say, man, what movie did this person play in? Man, uh, 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 let me look this up, look that up, and you're watching TV. You don't wanna have to uh, uh, bust out your computer or even your laptop, or sometimes even your tablet. If it's not sitting right there in front of you, this uh, uh, USB device right here that you're looking at, this device right here, and it's called the, um, I'm I M I T O I M I T O M X One Android 4.1 Home Media Center. This will turn your TV into a smart TV. If your TV obviously has uh, USB on it and stuff like that. Now this doesn't have um, um, connections for um, 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 like a composite or, or or component or anything like that. So your TV will have to have that connection in order to use it, but most HD TVs do. So if your HD TV, and that's why I said if you're looking for to make your smart HD TV, not uh, a regular uh, CRT, you still have CRT TVs. If you have already an HD TV, but you don't have a, uh, you don't have, it's not a smart TV. All you can do is watch it and whatnot. If you want the ability to download uh, uh, apps, you want the ability to um, um, uh, 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 to surf the web and, and, and bring different functionality to your TV, this is what you need right here. This is all you need. So, you know, just go ahead and, and download this bad boy. Not download, go to Amazon right now. Amazon right now and get this bad boy for only $60. You heard it right here on Tech Pulse. You mean, this is the technology that people don't know about. This is the technology that people are still gonna be like, man, uh, I thought you didn't buy a smart TV. I didn't. I just made my my TV smart. Well, how did you do that? Huh? I can't tell you that. You gotta watch Tech Pulse to get the latest in all of these tech gadget. I mean, it has uh, HDMI support right there, even on the side. So, I mean, USB support right there on the side. So, I mean, it's just one of those things where. Uh, 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 you can hook this thing up via a uh, USB to your TV. I mean, because most HD TVs have that port now, so this is going to be a uh, hook up an external keyboard to it, you know, via a uh, 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 mini USB and stuff like that. So you can, uh, it's easier to surf the web, or hook up a mouse, all this type of stuff you can do. And just for around $60, the iMeto MX1 Android Home Media Center is available for purchase, but it's only. Uh, right now, you got to go to Amazon for to get the best price around sixty dollars. Well, that's gonna do it for another Tech Pulse. I mean, you know, it's 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 sad that we come to the end of another Tech Pulse because you know, I mean, Tech Pulse is you know, I, it, it's something that you know we enjoy. I enjoy doing this show, man. And uh, we've come to the end. And hey, we're coming back on Monday. So uh, join us on Monday once again for another Tech Pulse. That's when we're going to have all the news, all uh, our reviews of different uh, tech products, everything you, you, you want. Join us again on Monday. We thank you for joining us today. For everyone in the chat room, thanks. We're going to see you on Monday. Enjoy your weekend. Peace.